Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to pass over to our guest speaker today, uh, Dominique Podvin. Now, Dominique works at the University of Sunshine Coast and research is there. That's uh, where I am also based. She's a senior um, lecturer in animal ecology and has some incredible things to share with us about the evolution of vocal communication in birds. So I'm going to pass over to Dom. Please give her a, a warm round of applause. Um, yeah, so hi, um, my name's Dom. And like Sarah said, I'm a senior lecturer in animal ecology um, at the University of Sunshine Coast. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about how songs um, evolve and how we can investigate what our animals are saying um, when they're making their little sounds. So a little bit more about me. Um, I actually did, I had a really hard time when I was an undergraduate um, deciding whether to do biology or to do music. So I, you know, I got all my credentials up in the music space. And then um, I actually did a sort of a double degree, a, a major minor in biology and music because I was so torn. Um, and so uh, I then got a job in the summer when I was an undergraduate um, because I was able to identify um, some bird sounds basically just from my musical training. I was like, oh yeah, I know that that interval. That's a minor third or whatever. And they were like, what? And I was like, yeah, that's a minor third and that's a major second. And they were like, well, those are two different individuals. And I was like, well, I can tell them apart. And they were like, great, you're hired. Um, and so <laughs> I got my first job um, during the summer running around the Canadian forest um, recording birds. And then I was like, wow, people do this and get paid for it as a job. This is amazing. Who knew? Um, and so I went on to do my master's degree um, in uh, Canada on bird song. So I could continue running around the forest and I've never really stopped. Um, so I did my, I came to Australia um, to do my PhD at Melbourne. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of what I did there. And now I'm at the University of Sunshine Coast. That being said, I've also done work in back in Canada, as well as in Finland. Um, so uh, in different sort of stages of my life on this stuff. So what I'm gonna to talk to you guys about today is actually, so I've mentioned song, but what really, what song and language really are um, part of is culture. And a lot of people think that, you know, something that makes us uniquely human is in fact that we have culture, okay? But in fact, in the last sort of 50 years or so, we've now understood that many animals actually also have culture, okay? Um, now, what is culture? <laughs> culture <laughs> is sort of a, something shared by groups of individuals um, that can be passed on or learned, okay, but are not genetically known. So they're not intrinsic. And I'll give you some examples of this. Now, the classic example, if anybody's ever taken an undergraduate course in animal behavior, um, they'll know this example because it's the one that's taught everywhere all the time. Um, and that is the, the example of great tits or um, blue tits here in the UK opening milk bottles back in the 50s. So what happened was a group of birds um, of these tit species um, saw that bottles of milk were being left at um, people's doorsteps. Um, and a few of them sort of problem solved and found that you could open up the little cap and you could lick out the milk, um, like the milk fat on the top of the milk. Now, other birds started watching them doing this and then they learned, oh my gosh, you can do this. And then this, this sort of fad, okay, this meme, this trend spread across the UK in these birds until like they were all doing it. They had to, they had to sort of figure out how else to put milk, give milk to people. Wow. Um, now, we also know that things like whale songs. So whales um, have different songs every year. They change them up and they teach each other. They learn. Um, and you have, you know, really specific songs that certain pods might sing and then and then pass those on. Um, a kind of a weird one uh, that happened in the 80s was um, a female orca started wearing a salmon on her head. 
and scientists do not understand why it didn't it just seemed like orcas are known to play and have fun and maybe this was some kind of fashion thing maybe it was a playful thing but more and more individuals started also just doing it just putting a dead salmon on their head and wandering around and then it just fell out of fashion so no more salmon we haven't seen it since it's just a really you know quick fad um and then the last one i'll show you is um, this kind of culture war between humans and sulfur crested cockatoos, a bird species that's quite common in Australia and that's very intelligent. Cockatoos have been um, trying to get into, these are our garbage bins or rubbish bins in Australia, um, and taking out the rubbish to eat the scraps on the inside and to play with the, the fun things that they find in there. And humans have been trying to uh, deter them from doing that in different ways. Um, but each time they try, the birds figure out how to get in anyway. Um, and so this is an ongoing sort of back and forth that humans are trying to stop them from doing this, but then one of them figures out how to do it. And then again, the, the sort of culture spreads um, and they teach each other um, and then they, they past um, our attempts. So these are just some examples um, of, of animal culture, of some things that animals, these behaviors that animals learn and can pass from individual to individual. And another example of this is in fact bird song. Now, when we hear a bird, we often hear um, either one of two things. Okay, bird song is actually a very particular thing in science. Well, we think it is anyway. Um, and it, the fact that, that um, only some birds do it makes it quite special. So birds can either do one of two things. They can either sing or they can call. And only passerines, so this is a special group, the group of songbirds or perching birds can actually sing properly. Song is usually a little bit more melodious, it's a bit nicer to listen to um, than calls. Here we've got um, something called a spectrogram and it's kind of like reading music. So when we record um, bird or other animals vocalizations, we can put them on the computer and we can actually look at what those sounds sound like, kind of like I said, like reading sheet music. So here we've got like pitch um, and then uh, time on the X axis and pitch on the on the X axis. So I don't know, I don't think the sound is going to work because we're on Zoom, but it's okay because I can kind of sing these for you a little bit and you can listen to my voice. <laughs> I'm not great at it, but this first one would sound something like um, whereas the second one is a call and that sounds like beep, beep. So this second one has these harmonics, but it's very short and sweet. It's actually for alarming other birds that a predator is nearby. It's saying, watch out. Whereas this one is more about getting a mate and saying, oh, this is my home and come and mate with me. And that's the big difference between songs and calls. Songs are usually for mate attraction or territory defense and calls are usually to just warn or to ask for food or to do any of those really like basic functions. The other biggest difference is that song has to be learned and calls don't. If you raised a baby bird, a songbird in a box, it would know how to make this alarm call. However, if you raised a baby bird in a box, it would not know how to sing this song. It needs to learn that language. So how can we study this? Well, we go out and we record songs. Um, we visualize them and then we can do things like measure them. So we can look at things like how high do they sing? We can look at things like how long do they sing for? We can look at other things like um, how fast can they sing, the tempo. And then we can also do something really cool, which is split the song up into pieces. So each of these little sounds, these little blocks, um, we might call syllables or MUPs, minimum units of production, but that's a little bit sciencey and boring. So I call them syllables. Now a syllable is kind of like a word and the song is kind of like a sentence. So some species, when they sing songs and they have these syllables in there, they actually have some really interesting rules, kind of like grammar, okay? And these can also be passed on um, culturally. So in order to know which syllables to sing, 
what syllables go where in a song and then the grammar, your syntax of the song, you actually have to learn all of this as a young bird. The way that songbirds or passerines, the passerine group can do this is they actually have a really specialized brain. This is actually a, sort of a diagram of a songbird brain and a non-songbird brain. It's as though you cut it side on, okay? So you've got that like cerebellum, that little um, wrinkly bit in the back there. Um, and this pointy bit is towards the front of the head. Songbird brains have a whole lot of structures, these really dense clusters of neurons that can actually, um, that are involved in the process of learning, listening, and then producing what they hear. So, um, and other birds and even other animals do not have this. Even our closest relatives cannot do this. So humans are used to listening to somebody, mimicking them, finding out what that thing means and then being able to produce it. A lot of other primates and mammals and birds can listen. They can understand what that sound means. But the big thing is that they can't produce it. Sometimes this is because of their, um, their vocal apparatus that they have. Um, but usually it's actually because they don't have this one piece of the brain that allows you to make the sound that you hear. And that's a really critical component. So what happens when birds learn song is they listen to somebody, maybe their mom or their dad, maybe a neighbor or an uncle or something like that. And they listen, listen, listen right after they've hatched. After a little while, they start to do what we call babbling. Wonder if anybody's heard that before. It's just like toddlers, okay? They start singing these little nonsense songs over and over and over again. And they're watching for feedback from other individuals that say, yeah, that's right, or no, that's not right, okay? Then in the end, they have what's called a crystallized song. So they are able to produce a nice, well, hopefully a nice song um, for the rest of their life. Now, some birds, that's all you get. You learn your language and then you're pretty much stuck with that maybe a few tweaks throughout your lifetime, but after you're an adult, you can't really learn anymore. Other birds are able to learn throughout their entire lives. And those ones are really impressive. Those include things like birds that mimic stuff. So mocking birds, um, lyre birds, that sort of thing. They're really cool. Anyway, so now we're gonna do just a super quick crash course on evolution and what this has to do with evolution and how it has to do with um, cultural evolution. So the fact that culture can evolve and spread. Now in evolution, okay, the biggest components are that we have a mutation in our genes, um, that if that mutation um, is not good for you and your survival, then it gets selected out of the population, those individuals die. Um, but if it's good, then it sticks around, or if it's neutral, it can stick around too sometimes. Then those become more and more common because you have more babies and all of a sudden you've got more of that particular mutation in a population. Now, you can actually have this with um, song as well. So those little minimum uni units of production, those syllables can act a little bit like genes. Maybe a baby bird makes up a little syllable and goes blue, 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 and somebody goes, oh, that was nice. And then that one actually spreads through the population. But maybe they sing something that is really hard to hear um, in a particular environment. And so it doesn't get selected for, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't spread through the population. Because here's the thing is that when you're singing, your signal needs to go from you to whoever's listening to you, okay? And so that signal has to reach other individuals. Now, if you're in a particular environment, say an environment that has really loud insects like cicadas just blasting, and you try to sing the same note as those cicadas blasting, nobody's going to hear you, okay? So that syllable will be selected out. It will, not, it will not make it in the population. But if you sing something that's like a low trill that can boom under the cicada sound, maybe others can hear it. Maybe they go, oh, that's actually really nice. And maybe that one starts to be used by more and more individuals. Okay, so how your sound travels through your environment and whether it gets selected or not is something that we term acoustic adaptation. And it's one of the ways that song can evolve. So 
I've been studying this phenomenon for quite a long time. And I, I'm going to show you two examples, well, actually maybe a little bit like two and a half, three examples <laughs> of where we see this happening. Okay. And one of the cool places that we can see this happening is in cities. So cities are really loud places. All right. Sometimes we don't notice until we get out of the city how loud cities actually are. You get out into the wilderness and you go, oh man, that's so quiet. Or I can hear the birds, you know? Um, Whereas, you know, when you're in the city, it's just a constant cacophony of cars, planes, motorcycles, people talking, dogs barking, all sorts of things. Okay. Now, the thing about cities is they're also no noisy in a particular way. So when you're out in the wilderness, there's a lot of noise as well, but it's actually quite varied. Okay. P things sing at different pitches. They make different kinds of sounds. In cities, human-made noise with machinery and automobiles and things like that are actually really stereotypical. They're really loud and they're really low pitched. It's a, the rumble. A city has a rumble. And so when um, I did my PhD, and there's other people that have done this too in different ways, um, I went around and I looked at um, whether silver eyes, so that's the little bird that I showed you ooh, back way back at the beginning, with those, that song and call, this little guy here, they're a very common bird in Australia. Um, they're about 10 grams um, and they're um, pretty much everywhere. I went around to all these cities in Australia to see whether these birds were singing differently. Um, and I went to rural places so in the woods, um, maybe 50 to 100 kilometers outside of those cities as well to see if they were singing the same thing. Now, interestingly, the birds in the cities were all singing higher songs. So they were singing these high, high songs. They were singing um, slower and they were singing different syllables, which I thought was really interesting. I have an example of this here for you. Here on the top is a city song and here on the bottom is a rural song. Now, the green box that you can see here is um, the city noise space. So if a car was going by at any one time during this recording, you wouldn't be able to hear anything whoops, um, in that box, okay? Now in the rural song, you can see that there are these two syllables that are completely within that square, okay? In the city song, there are no syllables completely in that square. They've completely dropped them because there's no point in singing them. Nobody can hear you anyway. So. This is what we're finding is we're finding that silver eyes and we're seeing this in other species as well in North America, in Europe, um, all over the place have actually started to sing kind of a different dialect. They've got like a city accent, okay, that they're spreading. Now, another way that culture can spread um, is if you go and colonize a new island. Um, and these are really cool because they're obviously you get you know, a bunch of individuals, they go over to an island, they go, oh, you know what, this is really nice, love coconuts, I'm going to stay here or whatever. Um, and then they start singing. So we can actually look at how different islands sing differently as well. And what we can do is we can actually check out, you know, are is there any movement between islands or between island and the mainland? Can these birds understand each other? Um, or is their dialect so different that they just don't know what each other is saying? And does that mean that they're starting to become new species? Um, and so this is something that I've been doing on two different species uh, or two different species groups. One is the silver eyes again, because they've colonized lots of different islands off of Eastern Australia. But also I'm doing this on Darwin's finches in the Galapagos, okay? So this is the picture of me in the field um, in the Galapagos. We usually need another person writing things down while I'm recording things with my microphone. We take a photo of the bird that we're doing so that we can see who they are. Sometimes we might um, do a, a little sampling of genetics um, and then we start analyzing all of the sounds that we do. So with silver eyes, they um, had this really cool pattern of going to different islands, like 
colonizing different islands, um, kind of alongside humans. Humans didn't really bring them on purpose to these places, but Silver Eyes sort of saw ships going and were like, yeah, I want to go there. And then they found places to set up shop. We call it assisted natural colonization. Anyway, in the 1800s, they kind of did this um, with us and they, they ended up all the way on Norfolk Island um, from Tasmania. They also uh, occupied some other islands in the Pacific um, at different time time points. And so when we're looking at different um, islands, we can say, okay, well, these are genetically the same or genetically different, but how do they sound? Can they understand each other? So here's two graphs and don't worry too much if you can't understand them. I will explain them to you just now. Here we've got um, different colors of dots represent silver eyes from different islands or from the mainland, so different populations. OK, and when we compare genetics between some of these places, and this is just in southeast Queensland, um, we found that the mainland, which is um, Maryborough and Sunshine Coast, um, were quite genetically related. Um, and then the island ones were quite genetically related. So that's Lady Elliot Island and Heron Island, two islands on the Great Barrier Reef. OK, but they didn't mix much in terms of their genetics. And we actually see this when um, mainland birds fly over to these islands, they often get beat up and they, they kind of get ousted. It's a little bit, <laughs> it's a little bit harsh. <laughs> they don't like um, newcomers. But when we look at actually how similarly they sing, while we do see a little bit of distinctiveness between the populations, they actually are singing quite a lot of the same stuff. And so these mainland guys, when they're coming over, it's not because the island guys can't understand them because um, they absolutely can. They're singing similar things. There's got to be something else that's going on there um, because they are, in fact, sharing a lot of the same dialects. Um, now, we do find that in some islands, uh, we get these new syllables popping up, um, and it actually depends on the kind of environment that the, the silver eyes are, are occupying. And so this got me questioning, well, <laughs> Here we've got this amazing system in the Galapagos, the Darwin's finches, right? It started out with one species. They started occupying different islands and different places on the islands, and they started eating different things. And that led to the evolution of different bill shapes, right? Either you're cutting seeds and nuts with a giant bill, or maybe you're eating insects with a little tiny bill, um, or maybe you're a generalist with a very I don't know, in between bill, um, or you've got some curved bills for getting into cones and cacti. Um, so we've got all these types of bill shapes. We've got all these species that now exist. Now, some of these species are occur on the same islands as one another, and some of them are very separate, okay? Do the same species sound the same on these different islands? Or do species that occupy the same islands tend to start to sound similar because they're living in a similar environment and therefore they have to be able to hear each other? Or if you're if you're on an island with six other species, do you have to sound really special um, so that your species understands you and they don't get confused with all the other um, species and birds that are around? We don't know. This is something that I'm trying to ask. So basically, I'm trying to ask, do the same species speak the same languages on different islands or in different habitats? Do we see species sounding similar in similar places? Or is it more like bill shape where you have a little niche and if you eat seeds, you sound like this. And if you eat nectar, you sound like that. And that's the way it's gonna be. This is how we keep ourselves sorted and separated. So in order to study this, I'm going to all of these islands. I've been there twice now. Um, and I'm also getting songs from other people that um, spend a lot of time on the Galapagos. And I'm comparing my results with um, already published genetic data that we have to see um, whether these guys have the same memes, um, the same syllables, that sort of things in their songs, um, and how we can try to see, okay, well, you know, 
uh, are these guys singing differently? Can they understand each other? Do they have different languages? Um, and I'm in the middle of this research, so I can't tell you the results yet because I don't know. <laughs> so I'll be analyzing that over the next little while, and I'm hoping to have um, that all uh, done by next year and to have kind of like a tree like this showing you um, the different species, but how they sound and not just what their genetics look like. That's it.